Um, could you tell us where you live and how you got there? I live in Bucharest, Romania. Um, I've lived here for over two decades now. Uh, I arrived in 2000 and at that point I'd been traveling a lot, doing a lot of different jobs. Um, I didn't have any career you could talk about. And the only thing that really mattered to me at that point was uh, putting myself in an environment where I'd be able to concentrate on writing. I published one short story at, at that point. So it it wasn't exactly a sane thing to do, but uh, to me, it, it made perfect sense. I, I knew that's what I had to do with my life. So I bought a very... A very uh, cheap apartment in a uh, not very fashionable area of Bucharest, and I wrote my first book there. And uh, I haven't left since because I'm perfectly happy here, and it, uh, in this place I have the freedom to to practice my profession. The um a lot of the stories deal with solitude. I mean, the story form allows you just to have a single character and to have a single thing occurring to him in that urban space, which sometimes you don't name, but the configuration makes clear that you're talking about Bucharest. Yeah. And your vision of Bucharest is quite particular. You know, it's not, um, let's say, the most glamorous of cities. And and you don't, that doesn't, the glamour doesn't interest you as much as the down at heel the building that's half destroyed, uh, what the Soviets left, what the Soviets left before they left, that, that, that all of that space is your terrain. From the very first, I, uh, the, the city itself appealed to me to the same degree that it, it repelled me in that it was the, the ugliness of the city was it, it's all there at the surface, you know. It. I, I arrived, actually the first time I arrived, I, I came in the 90s and you could see that it was a city that that had suffered a lot and even a large part of it had been demolished under the, the communist years. It, it was a very harsh urban environment, visually too, it's, 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 it's very striking in, in that sense. Um, and to, to to have a city like that to to be able to describe it as a gift in a way it, it's just it's 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 immediately immediately appealing to be able to describe failure visually because what you're looking at isn't it in 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 a city that's failed is the failure of of the society itself and I remember thinking even at that time you know going back a couple of decades that what interested me wasn't success because i was coming coming away from from ireland a, a country that at that time was getting very um excited about its own economic success i i was never i was actually always more interested in in failure um not even talking about cities now at, at the personal level i think failure is far more revelatory of 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 character and the human situation. Success is something that's uh, necessarily temporary. Um, you're not really going to see what a human being is until things start going wrong. And were, were you nourished by your reading of Central European writers, I mean, and figures who were not particularly concerned with success, but were concerned with misery, and with the sort of poetics of misery, and I, with solitude, and with a bit being with with being alone in a city, and and not owning much except uh, streets. Not Eastern European writers at that point. No, probably more the American ones. I remember being very impressed by Bukowski at a certain point. I mean, there's that's that's Los Angeles, but um, could you, yeah, could I you, probably could was. Could you tell us Bukowski? Could you sorry more detail about Bukowski? Yeah, well, um, that was 
auto fictional writer uh, Charles Bukowski who uh, basically wrote about being an alcoholic and growing up in the depression years and uh, finally in his in his 50s he he started to get a little bit of renown for his writing but most of the time he was just doing dead dead end jobs and I love the I suppose it, it's it's more of a, a punk aesthetic in writing and that it's it's consciously anti-literary and uh maybe um very vulgar and describing very mundane things uh total lack of pretension in the writing um but at the same time very very a uh, very funny too at the same time very very skilled writing he's, he's a very skilled writer in terms of um, managing to to compress narrative and uh I was very interested in, in the seamlessness between his poetry and his prose, that there was essentially no difference. He was just looking for the for the most um the, the most reduced way to actually uh narrate a series of events. You know, it, it took a lot from um from Hemingway too, though he might not like to admit it. Your your sentences don't deal and flourish. You don't show off, you don't describe things in great or glittering detail. You tend to have a very direct, sometimes quite a sour style uh, that 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 um is very clean and cleared and chiseled and um very, it's very satisfying and um, there, there isn't a wrong note in it. you know the stories are really beautifully made and I, I wonder if part of the reason why that happens is you confine your characters, to one, to maybe, um, to maybe a man, maybe a man and his friend, maybe a man and his daughter, or maybe a man alone. And that w- with, with that single character, with that amount of fierce concentration on this single thing, you can find a style that works for you. Uh, there's, there's two things. One is it's, um, one is I'm, I'm, I'm always, I, I think of, of writing as a way of achieving a kind of focus and, and clarity that's missing in our our daily lives. And I don't like going to writers who uh, make me swim through extraneous detail. And uh, I, I, I generally don't like novels. I always think that uh, the job of the writer is to, is to cut things back. I, I'm, I, I mean, there's there's some writers that I really admire, like um, like Saul Bellow, who don't fit that description in terms of the prose style. But uh, Bellow, for example, has this tremendous um, fluency um, and 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 verbal richness and energy. Um, but he's he's still obsessed with with this idea of of focus and trying to find the calm center from which uh, the world can be observed. Um, I just don't have that kind of, I, I don't write hundreds of pages. I, I, can't, I can't work like that. Um, and it's, it's my curse as a writer because I'm just, I'm always cutting, 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 cutting. I'm always, I'm always looking how to make something briefer and more, more, more powerful. I mean, um, right now I'm trying to get away from writing short stories. Um, I'm trying to write something longer and I'm having to retrain myself. I'm having to give myself some on-job training in not getting bogged down in a particular page and paragraph. I give myself a time limit to actually write a block so that I can come back to it and, uh, and then behave in my usual obsessive manner because there's a, there's an element of, of obsessive obsessiveness to it also and um, this kind of behavior um i i just managed to um to focus my obsess my obsessiveness on a on a socially acceptable form of of behavior i mean i mean if, if i was to connect you to anyone irish and it wouldn't really be worth it in the end that that there is a connection to someone like john McGarren who went back to the same terrain over and over in book after book that, you know, the same tree was in the same place, the same house, mm. same shadows and the same sort of lane up to the house and also the same grumpy way of, of responding to other people. 
And at that, um, you're not helping me sell any books here. <laughs> Look, these stories are great. Anyone who doesn't read them is an idiot. So I mean, let's just sell away. But um, um, but I, I'm talking about that sort of way of not being afraid to find the same the same apartment in Bucharest, the same the same systems. You know, the same, for example, stuff about dogs, stuff about daughters, stuff about. Um, leaking buildings that, that, you, that you go back and back to them in, in a way which is actually very satisfying for the reader because because you're in it you're in a recognizable terrain that that you are ah. that you are circling and circling in a way that a novel might do by just going on and on in the same terrain you just find mm. another version of it and go back to it yeah it, it a lot of it is just um very day-to-day things um I, I don't know I don't know how much writers um, choose their material. I don't know how how much you lose yourself in trying to be ambitious and go go far beyond what you what you really I was going to say no, I think it's what you really feel. You have to write about the, the things that you actually feel and see. Um, I remember when I when I came to Bucharest first when I when I was trying to write my my first book I I had the idea that I was going to write but I had no idea what I was going to write or what I was going to write about and the problem solved itself immediately because I was living in a a 10 story apartment block on the edge of Bucharest with a lot of day to day problems and a lot of um very frustrated people um it was the poor part of a very poor city. And uh, just in terms of the visual environment, I was, you know, I could speak Romanian at that point, but it was still, it was still strange to me in that it was easy for me to identify events and uh, things around me that, that felt to me like they were, for lack of a better word, material. They just, they just felt interesting to me as day-to-day happenings. And I ended up just, um, wasn't even a, a case of accumulating material as much as just trying to trying to limit the way reality was pressing in on me. That, that, that's what it felt like because it was just felt, felt like day-to-day things were were pressing in on me. And I was just trying to trying to sort them a little. So that I, I had a little. Uh, mental space and and these things actually became the became the the book the first book just very very banal day to day things there's even a long story there where i i just describe a day in in my apartment block and they're mostly they're mostly true things you know i was just where how do i find the the detail that uh, that's most expressive that was the question there, there are times when you're dealing very directly with now that the story is set in a given moment and we don't get to know much about you. For example, you don't, you know, suddenly say, would go to, skip two paragraphs and start giving us your Irish childhood. You know, you, you the character of you, the, the, the he, the protagonist at the center of the stories is almost stateless. He's, a, he's an outsider. He may be Irish, but he's, there are much more important things to say, such as there's a dead dog that needs to be removed. There's, mm-hmm. there's something leaking upstairs. And these are more pressing matters than the whole question of where, where you come from, what you're pluperfect. You know, he had beans, he, he had gone, he had come. But there's, there are a few stories in which the past really comes in. And it's not your past, it's the European past. For example, in the story Spring, um, you talk about bathroom, bedrooms, living room, kitchen, me and her and the cat living our pastel lives. And then you go on. I scan the old deeds, yellow parchment, a transaction, 1941. Couple, German name, no, no, Jewish. That was the Jewish court of March 8th, week after the pogrom. A, a mob, shops tr- 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 ransacked, basement tortured, chambers, corpses hanging from meat hooks. Immediately I'm filling in the blanks, someone with sense. Jewish, emigrating, selling cheap to a young couple, their friends, Betty and Nathan. I read on, Betty and Nathan's set up. And you continue, you know, who else was there? But you have that, but you have that sense that 
Bucharest is a city that once had a large Jewish population and now doesn't. And those ghosts interest you. They don't interest you all the time, but they're there and they and they matter. Yeah, in the same way that um, the I was describing how everyday things in the urban environment, I just feel them coming at me. And the, the past is the same. It's not something I have to go uh, look for. I, I do live in what was the old Jewish neighborhood of Bucharest. I live in in streets where um, a pogrom swept through in 1941. I live in in an area where where the Jews have left. I live in an apartment where Jewish people used to live. And the thing about the deeds, it was it was just something that uh, that's autobiographical. It's something that happened when I was I was I was buying the apartment. I discovered that uh, I, it had been bought and sold by um, somebody Jewish had sold it to someone else Jewish on um, a few weeks after the pogrom in 1941. So I immediately start to think, what happened? What happened in 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 this building? Did somebody with some money leave to go to the United States or Israel? Did they give the apartment to somebody they knew? Um, and then they left in the 1950s and they probably have children in Israel or Buenos Aires. I don't know. So these things about the, uh, the Jewish past, they do interest me, but, uh, again, it's, 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 I, I don't want to be like that, <laughs> like that kid in the, what's it called? The sixth sense. And he goes, I see dead people, you know, but I, 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 I always have the, when I'm walking around the city, I'm, I always feel as if I'm reading the past. It's it's in the fabric of the place. And I think you're very careful where you make glancing references to to Ceausescu and um, his building mania and just the amount of mm. concrete he not sought to put down. But but you don't want to go there. You, you mean there, you don't want to go back into the dictatorship because the post dictatorship. I mean, aftermath interests you more than the thing itself. Well, I refer to Ceausescu as, as the pharaoh at yeah. certain points because yeah. he yeah. he that's what interests me. You have this uh, megalomaniac, this uh, this old man who's trying to um, deal with his <laughs> deal with his anxieties by building the biggest building in Europe, you know, um, and that's that's what that's what's left to us is. Um, is one person's madness, you know, they're able to, to give it shape in concrete. And uh, he's gone, but but we walk through it. We walk through it every day. Um, you're not afraid in the stories to be very grumpy and sour. I mean, the, the sort of lone male figure just is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not as though things easily cheer him up. And, um, you know, it's, it's really enjoyable to read um, things like... Um, uh, the, the sort of Proustian Madeline for you is the, the sm smell of warm shit and cheap disinfectant. Um, it, it was like a Proustian um, fairy tale. Just, and then just suddenly easy to say, you know, I don't like dogs and I don't like people who like dogs. But actually dogs loom rather large in the stories. But this, this whole sense of the character as, you know, he's just not going to give in easily to easy happiness. There's one moment where he says he doesn't like the word feelings. And you just, and I'm saying you get. I we're, get we're talking mess. about a lot of different characters here. I, yeah. I, I yeah. and and maybe the way I don't, maybe one of the reasons I don't talk about my my childhood in the stories, um, as as you correctly said, is I I I'm sometimes autobiographical, but I don't want to be overly identified uh, with any of these characters. They represent me to varying degrees, but. Fair what you say. I don't think I'm ever going to um, join the diplomatic corps. I don't think it would work very well. Um, the reason I'm raising this business of being grumpy is that the stories then start to push away from that. And that you have very surprising images uh, that are really almost transcendental, um, absolutely ready to accept happiness, um, especially the scenes with the daughter. Um, but also, I mean, just to take, for example, the last paragraph of my life in the movies. Um, um, our kitchen is small but filled with the last of the evening light. I sit down opposite her and I wonder why I seem to observe these scenes from outside 
unsure of what will happen next and pretending I feel no confusion. She smiles at me lovingly as though I am a three-dimensional man. I feel vaguely ashamed in her presence. I mean, there's a, there's a tough truth in that, the whole sense of feeling that he isn't fully there, but nonetheless, it's as near as, as he's going to get to a moment of happiness. And those moments of happiness start to matter in these stories. I know that's not a question, but, but <laughs> I, I mean, um, but I, I suppose I'm asking you if very deliberately you, you realized that that business of the lone male figure in the rundown European city, walking the streets, slightly homeless in a number of different ways, um, that you that you you can sustain that for a certain length, and then you must do something with it. It's not a question. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it's enough to be grumpy. Uh, <laughs> and, and I. You know, I, I like grumpy writers too. I like uh, I like Celine. He's this the most wonderful grumpy writer. And I mentioned uh, Bukowski. Um, if if a writer is going to be grumpy, I think he should be uh, benefit from a certain amount of humor and self awareness too. Um, I don't know. I, I read Knausgaard lately too. He's he's very grumpy, but he does he, he's not he's not very funny. He's not very funny. That guy. And uh, but he's good. Can ask God, you know, is the guy who wrote my struggle in a number of volumes. Yeah. And he's good with kids, though. He's he's sweet oh, yeah. about children. The second book. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. He is, yeah. And yeah. Um, no, he, he what he the, the man has magnificent recall. Um, I'm very jealous of his, his able to, his ability to reconstitute entire conversations. And when he he builds a scene, he'll go into this this extraordinary amount of detail and uh, you read it quite quickly. Um, I recently thought it, it resembled more than anything reality TV. He's the, pro the Proust of the reality TV age, where you're, you're basically, what you've been treated to is a spectacle. And no matter how uh, ridiculous or uh, at some times he, he, the man is ridiculous, the man, uh, or, or even there's whole stretches where it's actually quite boring. You feel as if you're watching something that's real, you know? It's so it's like watching a, a very dragged out uh, reality TV show, but you, you just can't pick up the remote and turn it off. You're going to watch it until the end. Um, so, so in your book, Trouble, the, um, the, the figure that comes to sort of, um, I suppose to make the stories um i mean just to vary the stories and give you something new to deal with which is which which is which is the daughter which mm. is the child which is the, this image of the father looking after the child and the whole sense of looking after is important here because he is genuinely and he's, he begins to watch her world um but with great sort of sympathy there's a scene where they're on a little walk together and there's a lovely moment where she was two years old and she had to hang from his hand taking each ste step of the big steps. And in a way, that's old fashioned short story writing where you're just getting a little detail that's exact. You can actually see how this might happen. Yeah. yeah. A two year old going down the stairs. And then, and then, and then they're walking and you go, their, their journeys were always strewn with leaves, sticks, stones, and flowers to be investigated and collected. She drew his gaze down into the detail and texture and color of small things. They would discover a colony of ants and stoop to follow the line where it ascended a tree trunk across the footpath and disappeared into a crack in the concrete. She registered birds and dogs and cats and an entire universe of living things that he would otherwise be deaf and blind to. And there's another wonderful moment where she's asleep and wakes and it's clear she's hearing something and he realizes it's a car, but it's two streets away and it seems distant and enough, but she wakes to hear it. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole sense of, of her sort of sensory um, perception. Yeah. Becoming yeah. part of the father's um, life just as much as as his uh, as his way of looking outwards at the city that that she I'm not I'm not saying to you that she redeems she redeems the stories it's not that but she becomes a really interesting presence because she 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 certain moment you know, she brings in a sort of beauty and lightness and innocence into a world that isn't beautiful or light or innocent. Mm. Yes, um, I. Well, I am a father. I do. I do have a child, and um, 
I, I remember saying to to a certain Irish writer who who likes to write about um, hallucinogenic drugs that the 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 strongest drug I've ever experienced is is being a parent. You know, it does turn you upside down and inside out. And I, I probably I probably realized that it it was the drug I needed at at one point in in my life because I was uh, solitary and grumpy as you you observe. And <laughs> the wonderful thing about children is it does complete you in the sense that it reconnects you with the part of yourself that you you start to lose as you become older, that many of us lose as we, we become older, and that we should never lose. And it's a sen- it, it's to observe how, how the way that, that children do see the world as, as, as though it's created new. They are seeing it for the first time. And when you're close to them, you see it that way too. So you're, you're, you're coming back to your own childhood. You're coming back to the, the source of joy that we, we all have to maintain if our life is to be, is to be worthwhile. Um, the infusion of, of just effortless humor that children have. Um, I, you notice I'm not talking about the, uh, the sleepless nights and all the other things that they, they steal from you and the energy they suck out of you. But at a certain level, they, uh, children children do complete you and uh and i i probably i don't know what my life would have would have been if if i hadn't become uh a parent but it it's something i never regret um uh and do you do you ever and this is a really stupid question do you do you ever feel as you're getting the child, uh, you know, the child is awake during the night and you're not sleeping properly and all the things you have to do. Do you ever feel, at least I'll get a story out of this, you know, that, that, that actually this this child has been so good, not only for my general well, well-being, my general life, but actually the fiction has changed. At, at least something has come out of this. Uh, I, it, no, I didn't at the time. I didn't <laughs> at the time. But, um, but since, yes, of course. And... Uh, I've always kept a journal, which is which is a, a wonderful thing because you actually, well, you you remember a lot of things, but you forget a lot of things. And memory falsifies a lot of things too. And to be able to go back to what you read, uh, to what you wrote, sort of ten or twenty years ago, is an extraordinary experience because it just has a certain day to day texture that you'd lose otherwise. And uh, I love going back and being surprised by some of the things. I wrote, um, you know, like at the moment I am writing about uh, when my kid was small and things like that. And um, it, it sometimes I'll just read something that I've forgotten and it just sparks and I can go for yeah. for pages. You know, yeah. it's 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 very um, very cheap way to write a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You mean that an ordinary walk you would take and you would see a dog or see trees or the. Uh, the child would say woof woof or that that is registered in a, in a diary and then you find i can use that today i know where that uh, yeah a lot of stuff a lot of stuff i'm, I'm coming across in, in my diary it you see when you write a diary it's on, on one hand it's a horrible experience because you realize how little you change as well and how you're making you make the same complaints over decades and decades and worry about the same uh the same stupid things. So there's a miserable part of it as well, reading a diary and going back to parts of your life where uh, where you weren't happy or there was there was conflict. Um, but other times you'll just get a sentence will jump out and you you don't want to waste it and it can be the key to something. The key that the key you know, that opens the door and gets you another page, another page that. That you might never have written. Do, do, do you feel in Ireland uh, um, a sort of um, insularity, provinciality that, you know, something like the commemorations of 1916 um, were taken so, so important by the state, by people in the state, while you're in Bucharest, where m- many other things have happened? For example, um, a sort of strange native fascism grew. A sort of dictator of the most ridiculous sort, but also fierce, um, reigned. And no matter what you do, it's it's the trains to the camps yeah. um, are there in the background somewhere that that you that you feel. I suppose as Beckett might have felt 
that you're that you went somewhere real when the possibility of being somewhere unreal was offered to you on a plate. And now, uh, now with the war in Ukraine, and that seemed at one point a year ago as if it was coming very close. Um, it's a neighboring country. Um, I, I I read the I read the paper. I, I try and stay up and keep up with the news in Ireland as as best I can. Um, but uh, I I do feel very de- detached from what a lot of people would consider important political concerns in Ireland. It's uh, things here have been so much worse, and for such a long time um, between genocide and dictatorships of certain different colors and uh, now the war uh, next door in Ukraine and the fact that uh, democracy is something that you cannot take for granted. Um, and I go back to to Ireland and I, I mean, it, it's wonderful to be on a small island that has uh, that has so much stability really and hasn't hasn't been hasn't had the turmoils that this part of Europe has, has had. But uh, I, I don't take any interest in um what people would consider the pressing problems of the day, which seems to concern, you know, like I I'm sorry, I, I just don't get excited about climate change or gay marriage and a lot of other things that people uh in Ireland would consider extremely important. Um, they're, they're secondary when uh, you live in a country or near a country where um, democracy might not exist soon. In which case everyone's rights are going to, uh, are not going to matter. It's not going to be a matter of uh, categories. Um, I was one of the perfect readers of First Love because I didn't read the end. I didn't read the explanation at the end in italics until I read the story. All right. Uh, I, I, I hesitate now because anyone, you know, will come into the story. I, but I do want you to explain to us who Bruno Schultz was. Bruno Schultz was a Polish short story writer who lived to, who wrote in the 1930s. Uh, He lived in a town called Drohobych, which is now in uh, Western Ukraine. Um, He was Jewish. And when the Germans came and took Drohobych in 1941, he ended up in the ghetto of of the city. But he was a very talented visual artist. And he became basically the slave of the um, SS... I don't know what you'd call him, the, the SS man in Drohobych who was who was in charge of exploiting the labor in, in the ghetto. And he ended up doing paintings in this uh, this guy's house. Uh, Schultz, I think he, he died in 1942 or maybe three. No, 42 probably it was. Um he was he was shot. Um all the all the people in that ghetto ended up going to uh sent to one of the extermination camps gassed um but he's he's a magnificent short story writer Uh, i think he he wrote two volumes of of short stories and yeah i ended up basing this uh this story on the general who exploited bruno schultz i uh schultz doesn't actually appear in 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 first love as a character he he does actually just he's mentioned but he's not not by name but it's clear that there's a slave who can paint and yeah, can be used yeah, for various yeah, yeah. to I cheer mean, it, everybody it, up. It's you know? there for anyone who knows who yeah. Bruno Schultz is, who, who knows the connection. Yeah. But what you're also dealing with, I suppose, are the ironies surrounding, um, uh, you know, the um, the sheer cruelty and viciousness of what's going on because your yeah. SS man is just, he's, he's really in love and, and he really wants his girlfriend to come and join him. And he's right. It's written in diary form. So you're, you're sort of thinking, oh, well, it'd be good if his gr- girlfriend came. And then he just mentions, you know, the number of people he shot and they had to dig their own graves in the same tone, diary tone, which I think is, is taken from a diary, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. I I, I actually went and it, the diary is not published, um, though you can I you can find bits of it online. Um, but I went to a library and dug it out and, and sat and, and started reading it because I was researching uh, Bruno Schultz for uh, an essay I was writing at that time. And uh, that it, that is exactly what shocked me. Um, I was ready for the violence, but I wasn't ready for the fact that this was just, this was a man who was mostly writing about his love life and uh, how much he he missed his, his girlfriend. Um, if I did anything, it was actually to tone down that contrast because I was afraid that uh, it wasn't going to seem credible the way it was actually in the diary. The, um, th there's a story in the book that's going to follow you around everywhere you go. And um, I, you know, I'm sorry to tell you that because you've written an Irish story. <laughs> and um, and it, it's a story called Smoke. And um, yeah. if anyone thinks, oh, you know, Philip O'Kelly went off to Bucharest and, and he's been writing ever since about, you know, the experience of of the Romanians and, you know, the sort of the the, the dead and city. The, but anyway, um, no, he's actually come back. He's written a story called Smoke. Um, yeah. there, there's a short story by John Updike called The Happiest I've Been. And uh, no. I was just thinking about it. Uh, no, I don't, no one reads it, but um, it's um, it's just this guy who's going off to university, and it's the last night, and he's got a girl, he's got a party, and he's got he's going to get away, and he's going to go to some great university, and it's that night when he's at his most handsome, he's at his everything is ripe for him, and that's the happiest I've been. And I realize somehow something has happened since John Up that, that none of us could write that story anymore. Readers would just get sick. Readers would just say, "Could you give me a break about the happiest you've been?" And that, uh, you know, this, this, just tell us about this story, Smoke. I mean, it's, I, I think it's a brilliant story. I, I think in, in, in any anthology of stories set in Ireland by Irish writers, this figure is big. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's really beautifully constructed. The general sense, even when the cops arrive, you feel, I know these cops. And the, even the language, like someone say, go on, you did to somebody else, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. but also the background. If you could just tell us when it's set, it's set during a, 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 a particular event in Ireland that people will remember. Well, uh, it's set during the period when the statues were dancing in Ireland, all the statues were moving. Um, I can't remember what year that was, but I know I was a teenager. I was still at school. Um, I think, was it, was it probably 85 or 86? It was certainly one of those uh, mid, mid Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds yeah. right. Ballin Hospital, and there was uh, there was a few up the road from us in Waterford. There was one in Kilkenny, and there was one down the other end of the county. There there were a number of them started started dancing jigs. Uh, it was a real uh, <laughs> period of national hysteria. Um but yeah, I, I don't know how I got the idea to set it against that background, but it it just seemed to, oh yeah, it seemed to work because the the main character, he falls off a a motorbike and for a moment he, when he, he seems, he seems to have this almost out of body experience when he's, when he, when he hits the ground, when he's coming to, that stays with him. Um, and I, I thought it worked well with that, because his family is away. At, <clears throat> his family is away looking at the statues, but he's completely alone for the day yeah. for that reason. Yeah, it, it empties the house, which gives him an yeah. excuse for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, um, in in the in the updeck, of course, any sex that's going to happen will be really sweet and will be remembered as you know a great you know gift in a way. But I don't think that's possible anymore if you're doing, you know, teenage sex. There always has to be something else going on. That, that, that sounds terrible. Part. What? Are people not enjoying sex anymore? Um, well, I, um, I think in your Seems story, hard to there's, believe. A whole, there's a whole sense in your story um, that, um, that you, yeah, that um, it's not as um, it's not as exciting. Um I mean, there there are other moments um, where you describe sex where it, it is gorgeous, and you 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 actually say at one point you sort of now get the point of what everyone else has been into all along. Like this is um, 
But but I just mean that particular story. It will involve, of course, if there's a boy and a girl, something treacherous will happen. I mean that the girl will leave him and he will be left desolate. That you know that shape. What I'm saying that is respect, that now yes. that shape of a story seems to satisfy us more than the one where they could just be happy and walk off into the bogland or into the empty house. I know. I'm just describing what usually does happen, though. I mean, most yeah. things aren't aren't that stable. Uh, he, I'll, I'll tell you another thing about that story. At the end, he he, it, he doesn't just have sex for the first time. He he has his first cigarette. It's not immediately after he has sex, but it's after he escapes from, from the cops. And the only reason that is there is I was asked to write a story for an anthology in Romania called My My First Smoke. So I had to have a cigarette in the story. And that, that was the way I, I, I resolved that problem. Um, the I, I was talking about grumpiness, and I, I was, um, and I maybe went on too much about it, but I, but I do love those buildings and and the cleaning up of buildings and the finding of where to live and the constant searching for a haven and the sleeping at everyone else's floor and the refusal to do any form of nostalgia or sentimentality. We just don't have any of that. Uh, but but what you, when you then win your images, I mean, you win images of content images of goodness, images of beauty, you know, that they're hard one in the sense that, 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 that you're not, they're not obviously going to happen. And towards the end of the book, there's a particular word you use, which I, no one will associate with you, um, but it, it is, um, uh, I mean, words such as good and words such as love. And so um, he says, um, this, this ordinary business of doing things, which, are, which these stories are very good at, just the ordinary business of doing things, he got out and dried himself. You know, I just have to say, I think that's a good sentence. He got out and dried himself. Immediately, he began to sweat again. The sun was not as high now. It was a good moment to mop the entire floor. The evaporation would cool the place a little in time for the kid coming home. Not that she ever complained, but it would be a good thing to do. I think that's a, just a great. I just think that's a great paragraph. Uh, you know, because you're not writing it all the time, you you come up to it, you're surprised by it, and you're utterly convinced by it. And then, as the story is ending, this is this is a story called Dead Dog, um, and um, when the child was born and he first held her, he felt he was good enough to protect her and do only what was right. That was love, and nothing else held the foolish, precarious world together. And so I, I find that, that those those particular passages in the book extremely moving, but not just that, but really convincing and hard won. And, and they're part of, I suppose, the glory of the book, which is that 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 there is a basic way of watching the world warily, suspiciously, uneasily, of being of, of being easily alone, of being easily alone in a in a dingy room. And then out of that you can get transcendence you can get moments of pure happiness or pure possibility or even from the even from a sunset but particularly from the child and uh it, it, it makes the book extremely satisfying and uh i have to say i really i really i really love this book and uh it's been absolutely great talking to you and i'm sure everybody in the library has questions to ask you that are much better than the ones I've been trying to ask you. Well, so we should thank pass you, over. Thank you very much. Um, for those um, really, really, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this book. Thank you for, for your interest. <laughs>